Hey, this is Ian, the head pro here at EssentialTennis.com. Welcome to the first video in a three-part series that will help you win more at doubles and avoid the biggest mistakes that cause doubles players to lose. We're gonna do that by showing you step-by-step -step how to harness and utilize what I like to call the chaos theory of doubles success. To illustrate this, I'd like you to quickly picture the best doubles players at your local courts in your mind's eye. The first time that you saw them play, it probably seemed like random craziness, a flurry of faking, poaching, quick reflex shots, changing sides and signals, all happening in the blink of an eye. That excitement is created by all four players trying their best to keep their opponents off balance, guessing and uncomfortable. They're trying to create chaos. In this video series, I'm going to not only show you how to avoid getting sucked into their chaos, but also how to turn the tables on them by naturally generating your own with a few easy tweaks to your movement, target selection, and tactics. The coaching you're about to see was recorded live at one of our VIP doubles clinics in San Diego, California. We took players with the all too familiar weak, passive, and tentative patterns of play that are most common among amateur competitors and showed them exactly how to apply the chaos theory of doubles to bring them incredible results. Today we're going to focus on how to move proactively during your doubles points so you can begin cutting off shots at the net before they're even hit by using a concept called shading. So we're going to start talking about how to move proactively and be in the right place before the ball gets there. Who would like to do that? Yes. <laughs> Actually automatically be moving in the right direction and intercept the ball as opposed to again being reactive seeing where the ball is going and then trying to catch up with it obviously it'd be much better to already be moving there and actually just intercept it naturally and what we're going to spend the next couple drills on is going to help you do exactly that and this is called shading and it's how to move on the court with the ball so that you can be in the best position possible the reason why most doubles players are reactive is because they're playing team singles. They're, they have the mentality that they're covering their half of the court and they're gonna wait and see what the ball happens, what the ball does, and if it comes to their half of the court, all right, I got it. And they're not thinking in a team mindset or in a proactive mindset to cover whatever is most open. They're just planted and their roots are set on their own half of the court and that's what they're covering. And that's not good enough if you wanna be a good doubles player. The first type of proactive movement we're going to demonstrate is called lateral shading, which means moving with the ball to the right and to the left. Here's a quick example to show you how and why good doubles players do this. So for the sake of illustration, we're going to put all four of us in the middle of our own service boxes. So Ira Kirby, they're going to be in the middle of their own box. Mark and I are going to be in the middle of, of our own box. Now let's say that we're playing a point out and I hit a shot that goes across into Ira's alley. Um, Ira is gonna go over there, just grab the ball where he would make contact. And now I'd like everybody to go stand behind Ira, please. Everybody get up and go stand behind Ira. If nobody else on the court moves, from Ira's perspective, if you look behind where Ira's ball is, what's the most obvious open section of court on our side of the court? So most of you pointed that way. A couple of you pointed this way. In my mind, this is the biggest wide open chunk. Now you've all heard that it's bad to hit down the alley, but if Mark stays put right here, he's leaving from that angle a big section of court right here. Ira could also try an angle, cutting it cross court, but for most players, that's a mo more difficult shot, trying to land it here, than it is just pushing the ball straight ahead down the alley. He doesn't have to hit, you know, an incredible 90 mile an hour shot for that to be a winner. As long as he places it, you know, anywhere close to the alley, it's going to be a winning shot. Is it easy to hit a down the line passing shot? No, but that doesn't mean that it should be left wide open to hit, especially if your opponent is moving outside his or her side of the courts, which opens up a down the line target tremendously. Plus, there's another shot that amateur players have an even harder time hitting. You'll find out what that is right after I explain a critical doubles principle. A key fundamental here when it comes to court coverage is cover the easiest shot first. 
you cannot cover every shot on the court. It's impossible to cover the entire court all the time. So a key fundamental that we're gonna come back to often is the idea that cover the easiest shot first. So Mark is gonna do that by sh shifting a little bit to his right. He's not gonna stand in the middle of the alley, but he's gonna shift a little bit to his right to cover that slot right ahead of Ira. If I stand where I started and I stay put, where's the most obvious place to hit now? Right, it opens up a huge hole in the middle. So I'm gonna also shift to my right to, to block that. So now we've left Ira what for most players is the trickiest shot, the sharp angle going back cross court. Is it possible to hit? Yes. Is it easy for most players to hit? No. So we're gonna leave him that and cover the most obvious, the second most obvious, and see if he can hit that. If over the course of a match, he proves that that's his favorite shot, then we'll adjust. But from the outset, we're gonna cover the easiest, most obvious shots first and make him try that to see if he can actually make it. Now that my partner and I have the most open sections of court shut down, our attention turns to the other side of the court where a chaos-minded team is going to be moving proactively as well. If Ira plays his shot over to us, where's the most obvious target for Mark and I? The middle's wide open right now. So if Kirby is smart and she's thinking proactively, she's also going to shift with the ball to make sure that she's covering the easiest, most obvious target for Mark and I, and that's the center of the court. So we've all shifted with the ball in that direction. Everybody see what happened? Now, for the uh, sake of illustration, let's say Ira does attempt that sharp angle and he makes it. Ira, can you hit a shot that bounces around the alley? If I move out here to cover it, what's the most obvious shot for me to hit? That's wide open. So Kirby, seeing this transpire, should shift with the ball before I get to it to cover that shot. Now the middle's open. Ira's gonna shift with her as well. And if my shot isn't a winner, the middle's open over here, so Mark's gonna shift with me too. So as the ball travels back and forth, the idea is to move with the ball to cover the easiest, most accessible parts of the court first and foremost, and leave the tougher shots for our, our, our opponents to attempt. How do most tennis points end? With an error. So if we can give them the toughest shot and let them try it, it will probably in the long run be to our benefit. What we wanna do is shut down the easiest shots to hit and make sure we have those covered first. Moving right and left with the ball properly creates chaos automatically because you'll naturally be plugging up the holes on the courts that your opponents are used to having open and available. Watch as we now demonstrate a great cooperative drill designed to develop this movement into a habit. We're going to do a figure eight rally. Uh, what that means is Mark and I are gonna hit everything down the line. Kirby and Ira are gonna hit everything cross court. And so I'll hit to Kirby, Kirby will hit to Mark, Mark will hit to Ira, Ira will hit to me. It's one ball following that figure eight pattern. And as the ball crosses the center and goes back and forth from corner to corner, all four of us are gonna shift with the ball so that we're in the proper position before the next shot is actually hit. So shift, cross court, everybody shifts, and shift. Everybody go stand back behind Ira and Kirby, please. I want you guys to see this from behind. Cross court, down the line, cross court. Straight, cross court, straight, cross court. Yep. Yeah, excellent, excellent, excellent. All right, good movement, everybody. Nice job, nice job. Good. Excellent, cover the middle mark. Good, Judy, cover the middle mark. There you go, there you go, there you go. Okay, nice Ooh. rally, nice rally, good job. Now we're gonna shift gears and talk about the other direction of movement, which is up and back. And we call this vertical shading. 
This skill is critical to being successful in the formation that most doubles points are played in. One partner up at the net while the other player stays back on the baseline. Let's go to the court so I can illustrate why this is so important. Foundational to this entire discussion we're about to have is the fact that Ira and I are in inherently more offensive positions than Judy and Kirby. Judy and Kirby have to lift the ball to get it over the net. They're much further away. And so they're just in a more defensive position. And so Ira and I are really the ones in the hot seat. We have the opportunity for our team to make something happen, be proactive, close in and finish the point. It's not that our partners can't do anything worthwhile and good, they can, but we're in much more advantageous position to actually make something happen offensively. So as the ball travels back and forth between our partners, the phase of play changes. Meaning, when the ball goes to Kirby, uh, Kirby, can you just catch this please? Kirby's having to hit the next shot and she's in a more defensive position. That means I have an opportunity to get close and try to make something happen with the next shot if I'm paying attention. Now the flip side, that, the flip side of that is, if I do intercept the ball, what's the most open section of court on their side? Right, there's a huge section of court open right between them. I can literally hit the center of the court, which is the easiest possible place to aim for. So if Ira is doing his job, he will anticipate that as the ball goes back to Kirby and he'll go back to cover the middle of the court. Now, this leaves me with an option of an angle, but again, that shot is much more difficult than literally aiming for the center of the court. So he's gonna give me that and cover the easiest shot, the easier shot. Does that make sense? Now, if Kirby successfully avoids me and goes cross court back to Judy, now everything totally changes. Now the ball's back at my defensive uh, partner, so Ira has an opportunity to close in and try to intercept the next ball. If I stay where I was, where's the most obvious shot for him? Right, and so I need to move with the ball, cover the most obvious shot for Ira. If he can hit that spot, okay, but I'm not gonna give him this because it's the easiest possible winner to hit. Next, Ira and I demonstrated this up and back movement, transitioning proactively from a more offensive position at the net to a more defensive one, while Kirby and Judy rallied cross court. Take note of how different this looks compared to the average doubles exchange on your local courts that you're used to seeing. Ira and I are both looking to create chaos. I cover the middle, and now I move in. I cover the middle. Oh. <laughs> and that's why I was covering the middle. <laughs> Let's do a couple more. I'll go ahead and feed to Judy. So I'm covering the middle. Now I'm moving in. I'm covering the middle. I'm moving in. So <laughs> this is a lot of work, but it's affording you the opportunity to be in the best possible place as the next shot is hit. It's again, moving proactively instead of, after seeing Ira and I, doesn't the idea of standing in the box and watching the ball just seem ridiculous? <laughs> Hopefully. <laughs> Is this another way of just following the ball? So you're following the ball? Yeah, absolutely, okay. absolutely. Yeah, um, if you were standing behind me or Ira, you would have seen that we're moving at an angle. Okay. We weren't going straight forward and straight back. Okay. We were moving diagonally, tracking with the ball so that we could also cover right and left. Often doubles players ask us how far they should be shading forward and backward to make the most of their net position. The answer is, it depends. And here Ira explains why. Uh, oftentimes when I start teaching this, players just start like running forward and backwards. And there's not like a set spot you have to get to. It's all kind of dependent on the speed of the rally. If, if Kirby and Judy are, are ripping hard shots back and forth, there's just it's not possible for me to get all the way up here and then all retreat all the way back here just based on the speed of the rally. So you kind of have to 
judge how far you move forward and how far you move back based on the speed of the rally and what you are able to move forward and then get balanced and then move backwards and get balanced and then move forward again and get balanced. It may be one step, it may be five steps, but just depending on the rally, that's how far you can move forward and back. So don't just kind of like running forward, stopping, running backwards, stopping, just, I mean, that, that's for me is a little scary. It just puts you in an off balance situation and then you're never really balanced, so. Next, our students put vertical shading into action, most of them for the very first time, and they immediately started to see how it was going to be a game changer for them. Yep, that's it, Judy. Excellent, Judy. You're in the right place automatically. Good job. Yep. Yeah, 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 good. You were a little bit late with, with, your, uh, with your movement, but you were doing the right thing. And I'm still consciously. Yep, yep, that's fine. You're just a split second behind. After watching our students try their hand at this chaos-creating movement pattern for a couple of minutes, I set up an example situation to make sure everybody understood exactly what they should be focusing on with their eyes while the ball travels back and forth. Let's say, let's say that we're in the middle of an exchange. Uh, Kirby and Ira are back at the baseline. Mark and I are at the net. And let's say that the ball currently is traveling to Ira. He's, he's going to be hitting the next shot. And so I'm correctly positioned in an offensive position. Mark is correctly positioned covering the middle in case I get it. <clears throat> at what point do I start shifting back to play defense after Ira has hit the ball? Once I identify that I cannot make a play at Ira's shot is when I want to start actually moving back. If I bail out before I actually read where Ira's shot is going, then I could miss all kinds of opportunities. So key number one here as the close person is wait to read what's happening before you bail out and go back to cover the middle. Um, Ira, cross court please and catch the ball please, Kirby. Okay, so let's reposition. So now uh, Mark is in his offensive position. I'm covering the middle just in case he gets it. My eyes need to be on Mark. Mark is gonna tell me everything I need to know about what is happening next. If I'm looking back at Kirby to see what she's doing with her racket and she hits the ball in, an, in a position that's not great and I'm tracking the ball back and Mark is already doing this by the time my, t my head turns and it's too late. Now I'm being reactive again. The best way to be proactive in this more defensive position is to keep your eyes on Mark. You can, you can track the ball back to your partner, but as soon as your, your partner behind you starts to swing, you need to shift your focus to that player. Mark's going to tell me everything I need to know. If he just stands there passively or he starts backing up, I know, okay, it's time for me to start closing forwards. If he does this, then I know, all right, it's, I, it's time to dig in and really prepare because more than likely the ball is coming at my feet. I hope today's video was super helpful, but please know that it's just the tip of the iceberg. You can get instant access to the other two coaching videos in this powerful series for free right now by simply clicking the link in the description down below and letting me know where to send them. You'll learn everything you need to know to change your doubles play from weak, passive and tentative to confident, proactive and aggressive so you can win more matches, have more fun and be the player at your local courts who everybody wants to be partners with. All you have to do is click the link right down below, enter your email address and a link to all three videos will be in your inbox just seconds from now. I can't wait to continue helping you improve your doubles game. In the meantime, if you enjoyed this video, please click like and be sure to subscribe because we have new coaching coming out every single week. Thanks so much for watching, take care, and good luck with your tennis.